What will it take to fly people on Starship? One of my recent videos provides information on the history of reliability analysis and risk tolerance at NASA, and you might want to go watch it first. If you follow online discussions, there have been some strong opinions about flying crew on Starship. Here are a few examples. It sounds pretty negligent to me to not have some kind of emergency abort system. NASA will require years for crew rating. I believe NASA will not man rate it, since there is no abort mode. It seems that it might be very, very hard to convince the powers that be that Starship will meet an approximately 1 in 500 failure rate specification for humans to fly on it, not to mention a 1 in 10 million airliner style spec. Are these opinions right? I certainly have an opinion, but if you watched any of my videos, you're probably expecting it's going to take a while to get there. Just to keep things from getting boring, let's do something different. I see no significant barriers to crew rating Starship after a relatively small number of flights, and expect that it will be as safe or safer than other crew rated vehicles. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, feel free to tell me why I'm wrong in the comments. Or maybe you could watch the rest of the video first, and then decide. In reference to the space shuttle, NASA Administrator James C. Fletcher said, We will fly when we are ready, when it's safe to do so, and not before. When I read that, another quote sprang to mind. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. The problem I'm having is with this word, safe, because safe is not a binary thing. What we really care about is safe enough, or, to put it more simply, is the benefit we get from the activity worth the risk of engaging in that activity? Formula One drivers at one point accepted a risk of dying of 1 in 100 per year, and that meant the bar for safe enough. What about a different scenario? What about a 1 in 10,000 risk per year? Is that safe enough for this scenario? I don't think so. The current number is probably about 1 in 5 million per year, and there are certainly people who would argue that isn't safe enough. The main point here is that risk is a relative thing based on the scenario. What is safe enough to put humans on Starship? Here are five vehicles that NASA has either flown astronauts on or plans to fly astronauts on. We have the mighty Saturn V rocket used on the Apollo missions. We have the Russian Soyuz that carried 77 astronauts to the space station and back for NASA. We have the space shuttle, which NASA flew for 30 years. We have the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. We have the SLS rocket and Orion capsule, which NASA will be flying on upcoming Artemis missions. Time for a pop quiz. Your task is to rank these launch vehicles according to safety. Spend a few seconds thinking about that. Here are the results. Coming in at number 5, we have the Apollo Saturn V. We don't actually have a true estimate for this vehicle because NASA chose not to do one, but it's probably around a 1 in 10 chance of losing the crew per flight on a full lunar mission. Coming in at number 4, we have the Space Shuttle. NASA was happy to fly shuttle for about 20 years without good risk estimates, but when they finally did them, early shuttle flights were estimated at about 1 in 10. By 2010, shuttle got to 1 in 90, at which point it was retired because it wasn't safe enough. I think I might be making that up. Coming in at number 3, we have the SLS Orion, where NASA has chosen a 1 in 75 target for a mission around the moon and back. Coming in at number 2, we have the ubiquitous Russian Soyuz at about 1 in 100. This has been a very reliable launcher since the early 1970s, though there have been quality concerns recently. And finally, at number one, we have the Falcon 9 and the Crew Dragon at a NASA verified 1 in 276. How did you do? Any surprises? The point of this quiz is that NASA has been comfortable flying astronauts on vehicles with relatively poor or even unknown safety profiles, and their newest launcher isn't any safer than shuttle was, so it's a little strange to consider them the keepers of safety for human launch. If you care about this subject at all, you should go buy a wonderful book by Rand Simberg titled Safe is Not an Option, How a Feudal Obsession with Getting Everyone Back Alive is Killing Our Expansion in Space. 
His main point is that we know that death is a possibility in many human endeavors, driving, flying a private plane, skydiving, and also within many jobs, commercial diving, fishing, and the military. And we, as a society, have learned to deal with it. That's not to say we don't try to make those activities safer, merely that risk is inherent in life and many of these things are worth doing. The ebook is only $5, and it's well worth your time. Now that the preliminaries are out of the way, we can talk about Starship. Wait, just one more clarification. Crewed missions are composed of three parts. There's the ascent into orbit, the actual mission, and the return from orbit. I'm going to skip the mission part. We'll start with the ascent phase. Broadly speaking, there are four big risk areas. The first is what is generally called underperformance. There is some sort of problem with the propulsion system and the vehicle therefore can't get into its desired orbit. The second is a vehicle breakup, which might come from aerodynamic forces, or it could come from catastrophic failure of the propulsion system. The third is a failure of the electrical system or some other mission critical system. And the fourth is some sort of environmental condition that puts the crew at risk, a fluid leak or a fire. We'll start by talking about underperformance, and that takes us to talking about engines. How reliable can we expect Raptor to be? Let's look at two engines. The Merlin engine used on the Falcon 9 has had three failures in 1500 uses, giving a failure rate of 1 in 500. The RS-25, used on the Space Shuttle, had one failure in 405 uses for 1 in 405. 1 in 500 looks like a good starting point. We can get some context by looking at Falcon 9 first. We'll start by assuming each engine has a 1 in 500 chance of failing on any flight. Falcon 9 has 9 engines on the booster and 1 on the second stage. The booster will abort if two engines fail, and the second stage will abort if its only engine fails. Time for some math. For nine engines, the chance of no failures is 0.998 raised to the ninth power, or 0.982. That puts the chance of a single engine failure at 0.018. We need two engines to fail for an abort, so that gives us an abort probability of 0.00032, or 1 in 3,000. That is the power of redundancy. Having more engines makes it more likely one engine will fail, but redundancy makes it less likely that enough engines will fail to cause a problem. Looking at the second stage, its chance of an engine failure is 1 in 500 or 0 0.002, and since that's the only engine, that's the full probability as well. If we look at the aggregate across both stages, we get 1 in 430 as the overall chance of requiring an abort due to engine shutdown, with most of the risk coming from the second stage. Now let's look at Starship, keeping the same 1 in 500 chance of failure. Current information suggests the booster will have 33 engines and the second stage will have 9. What effect do you think that will have on reliability? The booster will be okay with 3 failures, but will abort with 4, and I'm asserting that the second stage will be okay with 1 failure, but will abort with 2. For the first stage, the chance of 1 engine failing is 0 0.064, or about 1 in 16. To abort, this needs to happen four times, for a probability of 0 .000017, or 1 in 60,000. That's a really big number for a rocket. The second stage has a single engine failure probability of 0 .018, but it needs two to fail to trigger an abort, with a probability of 0 .0003, or 1 in 3,000. In the aggregate, the risk is dominated by the second stage, so the overall value is about 1 in 3,000. That's a very low chance of underperformance, and that's for a fairly low expected level of performance from Raptor. If Raptor manages 1 in 1,000, the aggregate probability goes to 1 in 12,000. On to vehicle breakup. I looked at vehicle breakup due to engine failure to see if there are other examples like this Antares one from 2015. Atlas had a few engine failures that might have been that bad, but none since the 1960s. Delta had one in the 1960s, and zero since then. Ariane had zero, Soyuz had zero, and the Space Shuttle and Falcon 9 both had zero. This suggests that the Antares failure is probably an outlier, but if you watch the NASA crew safety video I did, you know the dangers of trying to generalize from events that are rare. The best we could ever say is, the historical data suggests that failures that are more impactful than engine shutdown are very rare, with some weasel words about how rare they might be. 
There are other risks during launch. The vehicle might break up due to aerodynamic forces, there might be an electrical failure, or there might be environmental issues. Despite the regular mention of Max-Q during launches, as if it is a significant issue, failures due to aerodynamics appear to be exceedingly rare. I don't have figures about electrical failure or environmental issues, or any ideas of how to estimate those, and they aren't unique to Starship, so I'm going to skip them. I think most of you have been waiting for the return phase discussion. The big risks I see are burning up on re-entry, engine failure on landing, failure of the flip maneuver, or failure of the catch. The obvious question to ask about re-entry is whether Starship is like shuttle. What are the chances that it will have the sort of problem that doomed Columbia? There are two important differences that make this less likely. Shuttle tiles were attached to the orbiter using adhesive in a painstaking process that took NASA a long time to develop. Starship tiles are attached to metal pins that are welded to the vehicle structure and are therefore likely to be more durable. This will, of course, need to be validated during orbital flight testing. More important, however, is two design choices made for shuttle. The first is the architecture of the shuttle. Mounting the orbiter on the side of the fuel tank exposes the fragile thermal protection system to damage from foam debris that comes from the external tank, and this was an ongoing problem in the program. 80% of the flights where imagery was available showed foam shedding. The second is the fuel choice for the shuttle. The shuttle's choice of hydrogen required that the external tank be insulated to keep the extremely cold liquid hydrogen from boiling away, and that meant foam sprayed on the outside of the tank. In the picture, the upper circle shows the bipod ramp where the shuttle attaches to the external tank. On Columbia, a chunk of foam came from this location and impacted on the wing where the second lower red circle is drawn. If you want to know more about why NASA chose this design, I've linked to my video, Why Does the Space Shuttle Look So Weird?, in the upper corner. There were other space shuttle concepts that did not have this issue. On Starship, there's nothing next to the thermal protection system, and therefore it will not be damaged from debris impact on launch. Finally, we've come to the scenario that most of you are thinking of. Down beneath one and a half kilometers, we're preparing to restart two engines, flip the vehicle vertical, then transition to one engine for the landing burn. Those were certainly three exciting failures, but there were also two successes. Starship heading back to the lander. We can do some math and look at the odds of failure due to Raptor failure, assuming once again that a Raptor fails once in 500 uses. There are three landing engines, and to crash, all three need to fail. The chance of a three-engine failure is the chance of one-engine failure, 0 .002, cubed. Or a whole lot of zeros followed by an eight, or one in 125 million. If Raptor is a 1 in 500 engine, the chance of all three engines failing due to engine issues is minuscule. We're more likely to see system issues. There might be fuel system issues, fuel contamination, or weather issues. Issues like these are more likely to occur than a triple engine failure. Can the Falcon 9 booster landing record tell us anything? The Falcon 9 has had direct engine problems in two of 105 landings, or about 1 in 50. Falcon 9 does not have landing engine redundancy, nor was the landing hardware designed to be crew rated. If it did, we'd expect it to be about 1 in 125,000 or so. SpaceX is planning on catching both Super Heavy and Starship at the launch tower. I have no idea how to estimate the risk of that. I can, however, surmise that SpaceX does not think it is significantly riskier than a landing leg approach, and if it is more risk, they could use landing legs as a fallback. How about a hybrid option? Put a Crew Dragon capsule inside of Starship and use that as an abort option. 
This seems like a great idea, but it has some problems. The Super Draco escape engines use toxic and explosive propellants, and therefore there is a risk in just having those systems in your spacecraft. Remember that a Crew Dragon capsule exploded during tests in 2019. The real question is whether the increase in safety in the abort scenario outweighs the decrease of safety in the normal scenario. The answer isn't clear. If Raptor is really as reliable as we suspect, having an abort system with Super Dracos could increase the risk substantially. I'd also like to touch on SpaceX's confidence in powered landing. SpaceX flew SN15 successfully on May 5th of 2021. Nine months later, they have flown zero additional landing tests. Further, the recently announced Polaris program features two Crew Dragon flights and the first Crew Starship flight. Both of these show that SpaceX is very confident in their powered landing approach. Let's go back to my original statement. After looking at the ascent and re-entry risks, I see no reason to suspect that Starship will be less risky than Crew Dragon on Falcon 9, and every reason to suspect it will be considerably safer. I think the common belief that it is high risk is because parachutes are commonplace and the reliability is not well appreciated, and we've all seen Starship prototypes blow up on landing. Thanks for your attention. If you like this video, please memorize the first 10 digits of pi.